were there any band disagreements about side three? Because this is what I would have to deem the difficult side, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. Uh, no, except for the record company. Did they say something? We're like, we're not quite finished with the album, but we're thinking of taking a few things off. Oh, but which ones? <laughs> you know, excitedly. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Discography, the podcast that gives Gen X music maniacs a chance to smell like teen spirit again by connecting with a brotherhood obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with three new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output and the time it takes to listen to one album. And in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans on the Olivia Tremor control. Psst. And then when we run out of spray paint, we're going to re-up and turn those fresh new spray cans on the circulatory system. Psst. <laughs> Along with our unbelievably special guest, Will Cullen Hart himself, who will be sifting through the sacred transmissions issued forth from his younger self and rating them all, every last LP, EP, and single, from zero to five stars. This is part two of a three-part, seven-hour interview. And if you're an Olivia Tremor Control super fan like me, you'll want to turn this free version off right now and go to the director's cut of this episode. It features 24 minutes of essential additional material and no ads, and is affordably priced in our Patreon record shop, which you can find at patreon.com slash discography slash shop. And in this episode, Will spills the beans on a track-by-track -track rundown of music from the unrealized film script Dusk at Cubis Castle and Black Foliage, plus his star ratings on his own material, what part drugs played in his inimitable creative process, and a painful look at the dissolution of the band, not to mention their triumphant resurrection for LP number three. Okay, first things first, you need to know just how seriously I take this crazy Disguise Graffiti is a music obsessive's dream come true. The guest and I explore an artist or band's entire discography in a futile but valiant attempt to reach a higher truth, which often is cleverly disguised as a nerdy compendium of star ratings and lists. The show is heavily researched and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. Coming up, we've got John Worcester talking about his favorite live albums of all time, Mark Robinson from Unrest rating everything he's ever done. Robert Schneider from the Apples in Stereo rating everything he's ever done. Oh, and Michelle Phillips rating everything she's ever done. Alongside Mamas and Papas author Richard C. Campbell, who's written a brand new book about him getting kind of itchy. So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and subscribe. And for a significantly longer director's cut of this interview that's both ad-free and available a week ahead of time, along with the complete versions of all our shows, just go to patreon.com slash discograffiti and subscribe. Even if you're not sure, just head on over there because it's finally completely free to become a basic member. We've got 100 episodes available exclusively on Patreon, and that number, as well as the discograffiti inner circle, is growing exponentially by the day. In addition, every single Patreon episode in the history of the show, including this episode, is now individually for sale and very affordably priced. Just head over to the Patreon record shop at patreon.com slash discograffiti slash shop. And away we go then. Yes. Tonight's guest, side by side with the incomparable Bill Doss, the psych world's greatest all-time ginger, these two pipers, upon stumbling into the gates of dawn, injected a well-needed burst of 60s sunshine into an era that wasn't readily embracing that particular sacred strain of smile-era psych pop craftsmanship. 
Yet the music itself utilized and continues to utilize the least cutting edge of 1990s lo-fi technology, the towering Kubrickian monolith that is the Tascam 4-track. This man burrows deep, and his sprawling works were never accused of being preferred listening for the ADD afflicted. Lads and ladies, gulp down the remnants of your moonshine acid and backyard psilocybin, because it's high time to twist the faders on the great cosmic mix and I'm honored to do so side by side with the wondrous Will Hart thank you yeah that was an intro man wow that was cool the, the ginger thing was great about Bill let me ask you a question in 1995 you guys formally went to Denver to record music from the unrealized film script Dusk of Cuba's Castle, which is commonly but mistakenly shortened to Dusk of Cuba's Castle, and of course produced famously by Robert Schneider. So in 95, are you showing up at the studio with fucking armloads of cassettes already uh, mixed and ready to go? Or are you starting from scratch in 95? Armloads of cassettes. Jack Young on 1906. As an instrumental, it was already ready. I mean, it had been ready for three years. That's my second favorite song on the album. Thanks. So we brought that and, and the cassette player and put that onto Robert's eight-track reel to reel. Who Robert's plays eight-track. the guitar lick in the intro that goes, man, in there near. Which one? On- Jacqueline. In the very intro, the lead. Is that you? Yeah. That to me, that's the that that and jumping fences. That moment is just uh, man, it gives me chills every fucking Thank time you. I've heard it. Thank you, because that's just the people's yeah. music. Was it your intention upon setting out to encompass everything in the history of space and time within the confines of your debut record? Yes. Actually, you achieve that for anyone who's not familiar before we head into a very impressive phase two. If you're not familiar with this record at 74 minutes in length with 27 songs, Dusk of Cuba's Castle, sorry, music from the unrealized film script Dusk of Cuba's Castle was a very large undertaking, especially for a debut record. It was purported to be the soundtrack to a fictional film, which immediately raised my interest from the level of a consumer that was about to lay down hard-earned bucks, and it covers a huge range of genres, including psychedelia, crat rock with the title track, noise music, folk rock, you know, and I gotta ask you, have you ever thought of going back and either making that movie or getting someone to make that movie? You can. That'd be great. It would be fucking amazing. What Has that not broached you as a serious thing? No. I mean, that... that I don't know anything about filmmaking. I'm a filmmaker. I would give up everything in my life except for my family, of course, to do you know, so. That's the thing that I'm excited to get into someday, you know? It'd be fun to I mean, imagine, you know, uh, like I'm seeing you now, right into your eye, you know what I mean? Look, watch my, watch my last film. Tell me if you think I got the goods. And let's continue this discussion because I know there's not a single person listening that doesn't want a movie. Please. I don't know what the movie is. I'd love to know some of your, I'm sure, many, many ideas. But I'm going to write down on my piece of scratch paper here, Dusk movie idea. And we'll see if that germinates or falls on its face. But, you know, I'd be curious. I'd plunk that money to see that movie. So Alf Abrahamson from Discography Soldiers of Sound Facebook group asks, how influential were drugs in the whole scene? And if so, which ones most prominently? I mean, I've smoked weed since I was 14, probably, yeah. um, to, be, to be real. And LSD didn't, like, like I, I think I said earlier in high school, you couldn't, you know, get 25 bucks or something to go buy weed. I mean, you know, 14 into 15. I lived in Dallas, Carrollton, actually, you know, suburb, Dallas, house, house, house kind of thing. You know? Yeah, yeah. But like I said, you know, that weekend is like, hey, let's get a couple of hits of acid. And, you know, that was the weekend, you know, and, you know, mescaline at some point. But that was it. Just, but but you know no one's just digging for dirt you know the real thrust of the question is because you know drugs at their most explosive and beautiful have a hoped for effect that your music is or your drawings or anything where it's like there's no barriers it's just a flood of imagination that's very inspiring so that's i believe what the question is growing out of is where people in the scene using certain drugs to prolong those states. 
by myself and, and some others, but you mean Elephant Six Wise? Everybody yeah, knows. yeah, yeah. It's not really as much as I would think. I don't think so. Here and there. I got to Black Foliage. Black Foliage, I was doing it all, every week at least, you know. A good, a good a gobs of it, actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? So I never did it more than two hits at a time. Oh, I meant, I meant over months. Oh, okay, got it, got it. No, I knew, I knew guys who were doing 10, 15 hits. I never, yeah, the, I could never I, stomach that. Yeah, I just been like, you know, you go to sleep in the next two days later. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is unquestionably 1996's music from the unrealized film script dusk of cubis castle there's no question it's one of the greatest debut records of all time it's like the explosion of creativity that george harrison had from being held back from yeah. getting to work on his material for all things must pass you guys had on your first release it was released on august 6th 1996 on fly daddy my favorite thing about it is that listening to this or your next album but especially your next album it is literally different every time. Jacques Tati, who is one of my favorite filmmakers, made a movie called Playtime. And in his first super popular movie, Mon Oncle, he created the French version of Charlie Chaplin, which is Monsieur Hulot. Monsieur Hulot is like a guy in a trench coat, you know, wearing a Mac with an umbrella. And he always, you know, just had a certain way about him Walking and stuff. yeah hapless you know just like the chaplain guy but playtime he wanted to do something where everything was shot in wide shot and everything is orchestrated so that you see the character that you idolize but you could look at anything and that could be the movie your tapes are so saturated and rich with detail that depending on what the ear decides to focus upon, the record is completely different every time. It's you fucking unbelievable. Me. Thank you. I mean, that's so cool. I do remember like things like I had a handheld cassette thing with sounds that I've done them, and I would do that when we were doing tracks. You know, so uh, you know. Yeah, you, know, yeah well, you could tell this is a very fertile creative period for you, but incredibly, you're able to package these ideas in ways that are digestible. Like the way that you package your field recordings in green typewriters is a thing of majestic creative power. It just shows a lot of control you had over the execution of your ideas at such a young age as a band. And, you know, what I had alluded to before, the first few thousand copies of the record were released with a bonus cd that myself and the original founder of the podcast joe kennedy we both had it and it was explanation two right yeah explanation two instrumental themes and dream sequences and the idea was that the record would produce quadraphonic sound when you yeah, played it at the same time but yeah. tell me about this being was totally no okay got it got it okay yeah, we just yeah, we realized later, man, we, we should have said that. It ends early and all that. We were trying too hard, you know. It's I, okay. I'm really proud of instrumental themes. Talk about a band with a lot to say. You guys are just releasing singles, and then 74 minutes is not enough time. You need a whole other disc. It's the best. Talk about, there's nothing about you guys that does not scream maximalist, yet you use the most minimalist recording setup. You guys are a walking thing of contradiction and beauty. Thanks, sir. That's so fucking cool man I, I need this i mean i've watched your stuff and you really did done deep into stuff and i really is impressive this is really fun to thank you well uh, listen with this episode i didn't need to reimmerse myself in the music i know it like the back of my hand it's not one of those where i had to it's just that i promised to do so in the intro and i do really take that seriously so i do listen and often re-listen to everything and, and you don't owe me a thank you but man do i appreciate it look i don't know about you you were both basically at the same age and I really need to hear that I'm on the right track often, I've discovered, because it's scary to have made the types of life decisions, at least that I've made. I don't know if you're 100% comfortable with it. In 95, in fact, while recording Green Typewriters, they only had one cassette. So it was a run on CDs, you know? So when I came back, it was like, ding, 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 still on the Sunday, you know? And then some other shit happened, and I'd go to work and come back the next day and add to it in the way that I've learned for Pink Floyd 
and how to change into things, you know, sounds and, you know, blends into this and that. I will say this as a married man, that the beauty, when you know you're on the right track of stacking tracks, when you really know you've got something is better than a girl who says she'll do anything to yeah. satisfy every sexual fantasy. Um, it still doesn't measure up. Yeah. I mean, to have a, to be doing a cool me and musical thing like that, it's just to, to play it back and hear it. You know? Yeah. Exciting. It is exciting for me. Not nearly as exciting as what you experienced knowing how good it is, but let's talk about the meat of the record. I'm excited to talk about it. Shut. And now, an important message from Don Bowles. Dan Kapelovitz is the only candidate for District Attorney of Los Angeles who has over a decade of experience successfully defending those falsely accused of crimes. Dan Kapelovitz is the only candidate running for Los Angeles District Attorney who is dedicated to ending mass incarceration. Dan Kapelovitz is the only candidate for Los Angeles District Attorney who co-created and produced the televised freakout public access show known as The Three Geniuses, which the L.A. Weekly dubbed the most intentionally psychedelic show on television. Dan Kapelovitz is the only candidate for Los Angeles District Attorney who is an accomplished phototheraminist. Dan Kapelovitz is the only candidate for Los Angeles District Attorney who now has a record label with punk rock legend and all-around weirdo Don Bowles. Dan Kapelovitz is the only candidate running for Los Angeles District Attorney who was not only the features editor at Hustler Magazine, but also Larry Flint's editorial point man for his First Amendment lawsuit against the military-industrial complex and the Pentagon. If you believe in liberty, justice, and the American way, vote for Dan Kapelovitz. Stick it to the man. Vote for Dan. Dan Kapelovitz. I'm Dan Kapelovitz, and I approve this message. I always thought of the Opera House as a thing of almost false advertising for the record. It has nothing to do with how much I love the song, but yeah. it's like this fuzz rocker that is not indicative, really, of the record. Yeah. Almost like a fury. <laughs> Where else would you put it, you know? After yeah, the- I agree. <laughs> Put it first. I was like, really? <laughs> it's a fl- it's a flag waver, and it's a garage yeah. scuzz flag waver. It didn't sound like that. I mean, I wrote it on acoustic guitar at seventeen in my parents' house, but I'd gotten the banana record. You know, I think I just tried to do something like that, like you know, banana. So I just made that riff up, and later it was like, sounds like something else. It doesn't, but kind of does. You know, <laughs> that's when you know you got something when it really doesn't sound like something else, but it feels like it should have existed already. Yesterday. <laughs> You know, right, right. Scrambled yeah. eggs. <laughs> Isn't this something else? Yeah. yeah. So I, I've heard that at least eight people play guitar on this song. Is that true? Oh, yeah, yeah. We did. have Everybody that was in the studio to do stuff. Yeah. That's wild. Just this one? Everyone was going nuts on this one? Yeah. Jeff's doing you. I mean, you can hear it's just blasting in different ways. That was the Robert was everybody's going to do guitar. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's cool, you know. So we made that happen. Jeff played, Julian played. You guys are starting to have, I mean, you're already there, a full working knowledge of dynamics in your music. Thanks, dynamics, do the right word. Let's talk about Frosted Ambassador. So yeah. I do love this. It's only a minute, 62 seconds to be precise. But what I really love about it is at a minute, it establishes its own micro identity, which is easy listening for the hi fi of the future, or even Burt Bacharach if he'd been dosed. Eric Harris, do something like Martin Denny or something like that. He worked over and- like this? Yes. Yeah, like a a dose to Burt Bacharach, which is fucking perfect, because to me, there is no better song. Jumping Fences is a thing of perfection. It deserves an intro. The hysterical thing about it is this is a one minute, 52 second song that has a one minute, two second intro. And I always thought it worthy of that. Jumping Fences is one of the greatest songs of all time. It's my favorite song by you guys. It's on like a very, very high tier. Is it Doss? Yeah, I'll totally. Is it? Okay. It's just like he found this perfect melodic phrase and just repeated it on a vinculum. It could be 10 minutes long. Does that have... Is that melody? Yeah, yeah. I'd forgotten about that until years later. It's a towering piece of work. It Bill goes, you did that. 
<laughs> oh, yeah, I do remember that now. And then, you know, right side by side with it, I'm wondering if this is you, define a transparent dream. Yes. Is yes. that you? Yeah, I mean, we're okay. all... Already, what's hysterically perfect about it is you obviously have your finger on the pulse of Beatle-inspired writing, but it's not pastiche. You've already transcended the pastiche and sort of shoved through a sausage grinder of your own perspective your own take on it. It's great. And it's the George end. It's the George Lane. You mean, yeah, George. It's like, uh, it's like the George Harrison inner light era, George. Yes. It's, the, oh. it's that guy. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I was going to say something about dark psychedelia. Two albums came out from the Beatles in 67, Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour. It's got some dark elements of it, you know? That's what I feel like Black Foliage has maybe more. Blue so. Jay Way and Flying. Yeah. Blue Jay, yeah. The, 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 uh, Blue Jay Way. There's a smug upon oh, yeah. LA. You know what? The way he delivers the vocals, I hear a lot of that in your 2001 record. Yeah. There's a lot of exhaustion that you really yeah. milk. The reissue of that? The circulatory system. Oh, cool. <laughs> Duh. That's yeah. right. Yeah, so what I love most about that record and about a lot of your solo stuff, although not all of it incorporates this, some of my favorite Beatles stuff is I'm Only Sleeping, I'm So Tired. They do Tired super well. Yeah. And Blue Jay Way and Flying is part of that lineage. And you have that in spades in some of your solo stuff. I'm going to ask you about it when we get to it. But Define a Transparent Dream has that somnambulant sort of a feel to it. And the third repetition of the chorus with the swooping harmony yeah. is so beautiful, man. <laughs> Thank you. You, you. I know you knew you had something the second you did that. <laughs> yeah. We did forget the lyric later on. We were like, oh, fuck, man. Out, can't come down with us. Out through the window. We're just on a roll through the whole record. We go from this to no growing. Maybe I'm getting mixed up with him. I see 25. He wrote that for David Bowie. So the opening guitar figure is just epic. The mastery of pop music that's on display in the song way, way belies your brief existence as a band by this point, or as people on the planet, too. It's so beatily it fucking hurts on my left side, midsection. Definitely not pastiche. It's your own thing. But like I said, you guys shove it through that sausage grinder and you reshape the wet clay in a decidedly Olivia-type manner. It's fucking great, man. I love it. Holiday surprises you. Yes. Okay. Holiday surprise one, two, three, six minutes, 11 seconds, an epic. This kicks off a straight up pop rock song, but becomes something much bigger and unidentifiable as anything other than what it is. Because at two minutes, it levels out into a drone that bridges us into a Lucifer Sam type of a spy theme thing yeah. at part three at three minutes, 30 seconds. This thing is incredible. Thank it, you. It's great. Yeah. I love the hard cut into yes. the Lucifer <laughs> Sam section. Exactly. <laughs> It's great. <laughs> that's, yeah. I think that's a Robert's voice. is just kind of fantastic. Anything about Holiday Surprise? This thing is a thing unto itself. It's an island of music unto its own. This would have been a centerpiece of a single. If you had released a, another single instead yeah. of this record, yeah. this would have been like a centerpiece element, like I'm not feeling human. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. Courtyard, it's sort of a... You know how the older guys, like the charlatans, used to introduce elements of music hall into psychedelia? Yeah. This is sort of a relative of that kind of thing. But the difference is, back in days of yore, they never did it in a way that got my attention. It just felt like a genre they should have left alone. But you guys do it in a way that you hijack it for your own purposes and Olivia the shit out of it. It always has my interest. It's a yeah. great song. Yeah, he wrote that in New York. York City when they were well New Jersey really yeah he was stuck there with Julian and Chocolate USA but NYC 25 that one was a reference to Courtyard NYC 25 David Bowie he was 25 when he wrote some song and he wrote slash 25 people think it's LSD 25 it's not it's oh okay <laughs> I always love when bands that are totally drug influenced defend the fact that their lyrics have nothing to do with drugs. I always think of it as LSD 25, but to me, TVC 15 and LSD 25 are the same thing. <laughs> so, Memories of Jacqueline 1906, one of the best songs that's ever been created. Is this all? Is this basically you? Yeah, 
It is. I mean, we'll we, we be off playing it, but I made this one up in 93 at 210 Sunset Drive, and it just cobbled together drum set. I will say that the, the riff in the beginning is one of the best of all time, just indomitable. And that bent note, I'm going to read you my notes, because we were talking about it before as if it was offhanded. But I wrote, and oh, that bent note, one of my favorite bent notes of all time. It's just well, I, one for the ages. Open tuning to just E, I think. It's always uh, made me angry at you, uh-huh. though. Let me explain. I've always been <laughs> angry at you because what agonizes me every time I hear it is that it's my second favorite song on the record, like I told you. It always has been. But I've always wanted, and the song part of it goes on for a minute. I mean, you could have you been a total hog about it, but instead you went entirely in, in the other direction. Why? Why did you do that? I mean, uh, Jacqueline? Yeah, because you, this is a very special song. It's a fucking great song. But the song itself, it's a minute. Yeah. Why did you truncate that? Why did we make it longer? Why did you say, okay, that'll be enough of that? I don't know, <laughs> actually. I mean, let's separate it from the song, even if as a spoken word, right now is when we break the static with our themes of liberation, conquer yeah. all we can. Yeah. I mean, this is heady, this is good stuff. And we're in and out like you got something to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is so amazing. At the time, it just, I mean, it's a little, uh, mm, you know, a little heady, but still. <laughs> it's amazing. You did something super special here in my opinion I, I think it's really amazing tropical bells my favorite thing about this is the deep lumbering elasticity of the bass and then the bubble blowing and background bellowing and the vibe and atmosphere and just the creepy overall feeling of the thing that's how i think somehow it relates to opera house maybe the fuzz guitars see a lot of these things are different guitars i never owned in my life whatever that that guitar is yeah that's scott <laughs> scott Spillane. <laughs> that's something i Borrowed from him in 91 or two, recorded this part. So you just had like stuff laying around looking for a home like stray dogs. Yeah, I did like I needed to borrow that. It was a flying V, I remember. It was shitty in a good way brand, you know, real cheap. Yeah. But it had a cool sound that sounds like that. And the <laughs> air, <laughs> fucking great. <laughs> I mean, I remember saving that. And I was like, okay, this will be something cool one day. It's a cool piece. I mean, granted, it is probably what I would call an interstitial piece, but, yes. man- but still mandatory listening. It's not like, you know, these guys are stretching out and they haven't earned it. This belongs and to them. God, thanks, man. That's no, I mean, you know, as a listener, these are flash things. It's not like people are sitting down saying, these guys have not earned this. But as a nerdy music lover, these are things that pass through, I'm sure, your mind as well. Yeah, transition kind of thing. This is necessary. Tropical Bells belongs here. Yes, thank you. That kind of fuzz. But you're right. Yeah, nothing's quite like the first song. Yeah, but- and then Can You Come Down With Us? This feels to me like 13th Floor Elevator Circa, the third album. Like a spooky Pink, pop. Pink Floyd in there, maybe? No. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. Like <laughs> mid era where they didn't really know who they were yeah. when they had their head cut off and they were stumbling around like a headless chicken. <laughs> but like some of the best work they ever did as well. Grantchester <laughs> Meadows, all kinds of crazy, great shit. Yeah. Scream that last scream. <laughs> oh, my. The, yeah. Old woman yeah. with a casket. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> a couple of the versions. There's one where he's got his voice is, yeah, sped up. I mean, that thing where that's right here that, that scream not last scream there's the one version where it's so coruscating it's like a jagged edge of sound that cuts at you yeah so next is one of my absolute favorites this is bill right marking time marking time yes is that bill well originally got an electric guitar but he decided to change it into piano he wrote it i think on electric i wasn't there with it but i mean one electric guitar with lyrics but when it came time to do this i mean he'd already done the piano already we used to go to the university here and they had open piano rooms that you they didn't really pay attention to that's how we did it. Dun, 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 at the end of the first single our day in life thing yeah but i mean you could go in there and he figured out what he was going to do on that and, and did some of those pianos then we brought all that out to robert and we recorded the pianos yeah this is a really special song there's a few songs on the record that really stand out to me and this is one of those and one of the reasons why it does is the way it lays back because yeah. it's, it's really not vying for any kind of attention the way the rest of the record's like Bleh! 
Th this this yeah. one has a maturity to it. It's got a laid back, windswept majesty to it, and most of it's one chord. And its spare, blocky piano chordings give the song a warmth that's really unique to the record. Bill was really like I overdid it. I mean, Bill would just sing his vocals. You know, he, he didn't try to push. You know, push or push it. Yeah, he tell, you know, he just did it. It was like it was beautiful. He could double his voice. Really great. So I love that song. Yeah. Let's please take Voyage now and talk about Green Typewriters. Let's be as maximalist in our discussion of it as you were in your execution of it. First, I want to talk with you about album sides. Let's talk about your favorite album length suite and where you think people fell short, because I know without needing to ask that you were a student of the sir or madam that embarks upon a side length song. So tell me, do you like Red Rose Speedway? Do you like Abbey Road? How do those two stack up? Do you like the formality of Abbey Road versus the domestic stoner simplicity of Red Rose Speedway? Are you a student of the difference between these two? Do you not give a shit? Red Rose Speedway. I don't really know that well. I remember growing up because my parents had it in the, in the eight track Kukunk. Big Barn Bed is that one of them? Big Barn Bed Big is barn. how is how the record starts. But the second side, there's Oh Lazy Dynamite. Oh Lazy Dynamite. Wow. I really don't know it. So it's basically it's a long, sweet thing. That's right. Abbey Road is like ten songs that were great, whereas Red Rose Speedway he described it as you know just a bunch of stuff I had laying around. So it was like Paul's dog shit, but strung together. Paul's dog shit be strung together. But yeah. it's I think it's really good because it's like this shadow of what Abbey Road was, but it's still Paul. It's so good. Is my love in, the, in that whole thing? Or is it yeah, so yeah, yeah. Red Rose is underrated, but Green Typewriters, just a thing of amazement. Talk to me about this. Wildlife, man. That Wildlife is amazing. Side two. Side yeah. one's okay, but side two, you have Some People Never Know, Tomorrow, Your Singer, that's a great album yeah, side. You know, wildlife. What's going to happen to you? He said, deal. He, he said later on, his wife, whatever, you know, they turned he vegetarian. And I've been vegetarian since 87. So Abbey Road, to get back, it helped me understand some of this, you know, the way they use different combinations of things. Abbey Road's good. But I do have to say this. Uh, John Lennon, whatever, a state owes Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> You've heard of a song called Albatross. They they copied <laughs> yeah. they copied Sun King. Here's the thing, though. To anyone who's not familiar with this record, who's listening to this program right now, because that will be happening. When you get to this point, really, I never urge people to stop the show. Stop the show. Listen to Green Typewriters and come back. This stands alone in this type of songwriting. Talk to me, please, about the idea behind making it. What conceptually was the thrust behind Green Typewriters? Hi, I'm Dave Gebro. I threw my career as a licensed hearing instrument specialist in the trash, sold my house, and moved to the East Coast with my wife and four-year-old son in order to focus on making the ultimate podcast for music obsessives thrive. Now I need your help. Although Discography is rated in the top 2% of all podcasts globally, the economics of this thing are tricky. Becoming a member of Discography's Patreon gives you access to over 100 more exclusive episodes. Episodes. And moving forward now, every Sunday for only $5 a month as a private first class, you get our new weekly show by and for Discography's Patreon family, the Discography Soldiers of Sound podcast. It'll be hosted by Rudy Fishman. And given his sociopathic tendencies, I'm sure it'll have a lunatic's take over the asylum edge to it. If all you want to do is show some love, there's now finally a $1 tier. Don't miss out. Become a recruit and get your personal personalized backstage pass for a buck. And for the cheapskates, homeless people, and all the bums sponging off mom and dad, don't care, just join. It's now completely free to join as a basic member, and it'll be the only place you'll be able to get our upcoming Lou Barlow, Corey Hansen, Mark Robinson comp, Metal Machine Muzak, as well as the triple album rock opera El Farmony I created with Joe Kennedy as the mentally regarded, and the ability to purchase one-off Patreon episodes. That's it, back to the show. What conceptually was the thrust behind Green Typewriters? To be really honest, that's realness to me. You know, like, uh, wake me up, you know. We had to make something happen, you know. Because, like I said, my dad was like, you can't call me for money anymore, you know what I mean? And I, 
was having trouble finding a job. And, you know, on and on. So we were just like, we've got to make this fucking shit happen. You know, we were so excited, but to make some things happen, you know, you're 20 something here. But I mean, green, yeah, but green typewriter, it was just, it did it by itself once I got that song. You know, can we? I realized now it's first person. I did a lot of first, you know, first person stuff. Where now I usually say we a lot more here, but it's like when you wake me up in the morning, blue, you feeling it. That person, that person's feeling it. You know, oh, like me, please. And and you know, I wanted this real lashing out, saying, you know, help me here, or let's make some beautiful shit happen. <laughs> so tell me, is it just something that sounds incredible? Because it is an amazing lyric, but is there something beyond how great the words are that you had intended with, hey, it's been so long, I'm out on the lawn watching 100 typewriters soaked in green paint? Is that psychedelic gobbledygook, or is there something in there below it without you having to hang your lyrics out like dirty that's, laundry? That's all real to me. That person's, you know, reaching out for uh, humanity. And yeah, this is, this is Alice in Wonderland, basically. This feels to me like, you know, sliding down that, that hole. Okay, green typewriters too. I have always loved that single snare march. I don't know why, but what? at 34 seconds, Green Typewriters 2 somehow yeah. always was this majestic all timer for me. <laughs> so quick. That always felt like reporting for duty, sir. <laughs> and I've always really connected with part three. The stillness of a Sunday life seems like a cathedral, especially with that really riveting wash of synths. Yeah, I mean, that cascade is just pure gorgeousity did eric go in and just paint all these dabs all over the place yes indeed yes indeed. okay so the moody sort of harrison-esque mo pop of part four you know i don't want to die inside anymore i don't want to hear that song anymore where was the thrust behind that when i was talking about that the first part i was mixing it up with that one where i got mixed up that that kid you know was really searching you know it's real yeah yeah it's really real that person's real mm -hmm. A few things came to mind, which is George Harrison came out of the gate as somebody who just was annoyed by everything. His first song as a Beatle was Don't Bother Me. It wasn't anything that was like Ravi Shankar. That came later. You know, really, he was just annoyed at everything. And so he needed TM or, you know, needed yeah. Ravi Shankar and all these other things to kind of connect with something else. But yeah, Green Typewriters 5 is like a throbby pulse at about a minute long. Green Typewriters Writer 6 is a 30-second triumphant rise from the wreckage, a wild flailing clarinet march. And then Green Typewriter 7, and stop me, if you got anything to say, I will shut the fuck up. No, it's cool. it's cool. And this, what comes after that? And then Green Typewriter 7 is a minute and a half of Dukes of Stratosphere type vocal modulation experiments, like a spot on goblin party. <laughs> spot on goblin. And then, man, do I love this. And this is what I'm talking about as far as I can almost see it. Like, I'm not synesthetic, unfortunately, but I can almost see it as like looking out a submarine window and when i look out that window there's a whole other world just a country road and i'm yeah. at a distance and i'm watching a car go by every now and then but there's the plank of you know a drop of water coming by every now and then in a sink that's partially filled and a synth warble and distracted barroom style piano and this is where the great patrick tape fleming who is a great man, he asked me to please ask you, how much longer can he wait? Uh, uh, forever. <laughs> okay, forever is the answer. When that comes in, my mind is truly blown. Like in a music way, it doesn't get much better than that. If, you, if you've really waited through the entire nine minutes and 39 seconds of that, and then yeah. come across that line, you have been liberated in a way musically that you can't really compare to much else. Were you expecting the first time you heard it? Huh? First time I heard that, I think I came. <laughs> 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 There's maybe a thing about Roxy music in every dream home of heartache. It's like, a, he goes, uh, 
yeah. brush you up nicely and you open point. But, and living. Was that an influence? Because that's a great example, and I don't know if that was a direct influence, but the way that song goes and then stops and then that crazy vocal modulation happens and then there's that crazy guitar. So in Green Typewriters, there's that elegiac, almost free bird-like guitar solo. Uh -huh. Does it come out of Dream Home? Yeah, actually. I mean, I don't think I thought about it, but yes. Bill and I loved that, you know, when we got Roxy to the second album, <laughs> left bungalow ranch style and, you know, just right like, right i mean there's different types of psychedelia i mean that's and i think that i think their second album is both albums the first night i ever did acid that was the first time i was introduced to the bogus man and i remember my friend was a huge fan and was so psyched that we were doing this today when i was looking at him there were dancing question marks <laughs> it doesn't get better than that so green typewriters 10 is that lj coda more incredibleness just tumbling down the pike, a knowing, winkingly warm hug of a final embrace on the back end of the suite. Classic backwards cut type things. It's so good. Green typewriters, there's no part of it that feels tired, that doesn't belong in it. You know that Her Majesty originally was part of the suite, right? Yeah, that's so cool. It's funny that it was recognized that it didn't work as part of it. Because it's just, you know, when you look at green typewriters and you're experiencing it again and again, and it becomes part of the fabric and you know it from every angle, it really is perfect. There's no Her Majesty in it. There's no part that doesn't belong so perfectly as a jigsaw piece. Is that really the deal? Like, they cut out, they put it at the very end of the tape. They didn't. The engineer was like, I'm not getting rid of this. It's the Beatles. I'll put it at the end. And McCartney was like, whoa, this is cool like this. Let's actually have it as part of the record. So cool. See, he was experimental. He wasn't just the McCartney. He was the Lennon, too. He was the guy about town. Then we're at Spring Succeeds. Yes. That, is that you or he? That's totally Bill. That feels very heavy on the charlatans. Really? <laughs> Well, I was just say that it's Beatles to us, but we decided to put everything in one speaker because the Beatles did <laughs> the stereo, you know, like the inner life sound, all the stuff, and he just in one speaker. But so we just thought <laughs> we got to do Beatles, so we'll put. In Who is theme for a very delicious grand piano? Is that you or that's, that's you? Yeah. That's gorgeous, gorgeous and haunting, of course. I could smell the leaves. That's Bill, right? That's me. Is that you? Yeah, actually. That's awesome. Always yeah, been one of my favorites. I lived in Denver, and I borrowed a four-track cassette. I didn't have one at that time. Robert loaned me that four-track for that weekend. We both lived there. And I'm from the South, if you've ever been to the fucking South in the summer. Anyway, it was beautiful out there in the mountains, you know. And so I really went and walk into that happened, you know, it was beautiful. So I can spell leaves, right? This flies in the face of the established notions for sure, because this to me always felt like a loving salute to AM Gold. It feels like Seals and Crofts, you know, some of the classics that tumbled down the pike. And this is my favorite song on the second half of the record. Thank you, man. That's so cool. I mean, I came back from a nice walk in the park and wrote it in five minutes, you know? Really? Yeah. God <laughs> damn, dude. Yeah, that's so, amazing. Thank you. I mean, it's just... Well, that's what I mean. That's, that's how things can happen to me. I really went for a walk and it was really, there were bugs everywhere. I was really inspired by it. And Thank God for that walk. It's always been one of my favorite songs you've written. But at the very end of it, the leaves, <laughs> is that what it is? Leaves grow older. Is the so organ that, work? Is that Eric? No, that's me. Actually. Is that you? Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, Jeff's had a, some kind of organ at the time, so I borrowed that for that week. Weekend too. Yeah, I love that. He uses it on you know a lot of his stuff. So. All right, talk to me about the title track because when I really broke it down, because I never really sat down and was formal about it, but the synth beds and singing bowls, you know, that's like two minutes and forty seconds. That's not an interstitial. That's like a full song unto itself. And yeah. then the drums fade in at two forty. I never knew how long it took to get there until now. Yeah, that's uh, kind of ballsy. <laughs> takes over yeah once it officially becomes a lucky tune unto itself holy shit does the song rip my yeah. favorite thing has always been the bass line yeah thank you but do 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 boot do do is that yeah. you that's me yeah. that's fucking nuts thank you I, I love i i've written a few songs with bass lines throughout my life you know 
And that's, I, I love to do that. It's fun. That's, that's the beating heart of that song for sure. Thanks, Captain. Thank you, Captain. You know, I had also forgotten that the construction of this song kind of dribbles to a close and minimizes to where it becomes almost a straight up ambient track before concluding. And that's backwards uh, John Cage at the end. That song is such an incredible combination of accessible and thoroughly inaccessible. Thank you, man. It's so cool. I'm so just so nice and just awesome. Thank you. Thank you. One of the great aspects of the record is it just keeps ending and ending and <laughs> ending. I love Dusk because it ends 20 times. It definitely ends at the end of Typewriters. It definitely ends at the end of Dusk. It definitely ends at the end of Gravity Car, and it ends again at NYC 25. So Gravity Car is a minute 45 of weird, wild, and woolly waltz timiness, you know, which of course ingeniously sets us up for yet another album ender. Is Gravity Car more you? That's me, yeah, totally. Okay. But everybody's playing on it, but, but that means... Okay, yeah. germinated by you. And then NYC 25, is that you or Bill? That's Bill. A perfect closer. It's a true arm in arm, hands across America. Really, Bill, Bill being in wherever you grew up, <laughs> New Jersey, you know, a few months until he could come back and, you know, writing stuff. And, and he wrote that one, you know, in, you know, I got to think about it, some of the lyrics, but, but he was like, man, you know, it's not just your dream. It's my dream, too. Well, it's, I can't wait to get back and get this going, you know. Well, one of the things where you guys take a page from the best aspects of the Lennon and McCartney partnership is with nyc 25 lyrically that line pleasant dreams and please don't sleep too long it takes a page from that we can work it out that's, where that's, where the middle eight is dour it's riding that same line that's so cool i mean that was absolutely for me i mean don't sleep too long buddy you know don't forget about me you know, you've done beautiful things <laughs> And then, of course, our kiss on the lips goodnight is closing with that classic singing saw. Is that Julian? Julian, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He also yeah. does on Can You Come Down With Us, that stuff near the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I kind of like Pink Floyd, Piper. So. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I yeah. I thought I'd say that. I was like, that made it incredible. Overall, there are very few albums that I can point to and say, this is a perfect record. Music from the unrealized film script, Dusk at Cubist Castle. From the title to the music, the cover, the chaotic waywardness of it as a rolling, almost unending piece of music, to the tidiness of the songwriting arrangements and melodies, to the perfect amalgamation of 1960s psychedelic songwriting inspiration and lo-fi recording techniques. This is a perfect record. Five stars. Man, five you. stars for sure. That's a really hard five. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> without a doubt, man. Deep five to know how much you put it means. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It doesn't mean anything coming from me. What means something is that you recorded what you did because it'll last forever. And people are still talking about it. People still get crazy when they bring it up. Because to me, and you know, this is just one guy's opinion. It doesn't mean it's better than this or that. Or from the Elephant Six recording world, it was yeah. always the most important record. Wow. Really? Thank it you. was as you and I have discussed, it's the color white because it has everything in it it includes everything in it so to me it is the musical definition of the color white thank you all right let's let's go back to i'm just gonna say dusk that's but yeah that's that's what once <laughs> just once i'm gonna say <laughs> I mean, let's build because yeah, like, i didn't promise right. myself as a t as Dusk, yeah. Should we let's call it Dusk, okay? So let me ask you, did pop, the straight up pop music, was that feeling fake or like anathema to you by this point? What was your relationship with pop music? Well, I mean like uh if you're gonna come out with a release like this after your big breakthrough record, yeah. then one of your instincts got to be to run away from success. So yeah. did pop feel fake or like it was a cheap sellout move? You didn't want to be pushed, you know, too too far, you know. It was happening all quickly, like I said, eight times. So are you thinking in your heart, fuck this, about your success? Like, this in is way, not to be trusted? In a way, I kind of was, in a way. Were you not as happy? Once the success hit, were you mysteriously finding yourself not as happy as when you were just left alone to do no, your... No, no. No? I mean, I'm happy I wanted all that all happened, but we didn't know where it was going, you know? Yeah. 
you know, it could could have been pushed in sudden or U two, you know, or whatever. You mean the U two of the sprawling psychedelic dreamscape? Uh, yeah, decent. Yeah. yeah, no, you guys had what it took. Your sense of melody, if you yeah. decided to go in that direction, it's achievable. It's just yeah. your interests were so widespread. How the fuck do you corral uh, what you did yeah. into a, one slice of how you write a song? Black yeah, well, Foliage yeah. Animation Music Volume One. Oh, hi, Dave again. I got to tell you about the next tier. As a lieutenant, you get an ad-free, substantially elongated director's cut of every episode. And you'll be getting the shows an entire week early from now on. And now back to our expertly crafted program. Black Foliage Animation Music Volume 1. So yeah. let's go back to that request in the liner notes of Dusk, you asking the fans to mail the band cassette tapes of themselves describing dreams. Talk yeah. to me about the onslaught. Did you get a lot of mail? We got maybe seven to ten of them. That's yeah. it? Seven to ten tapes? Yeah. I mean, one, one was like a mini cassette uh, and it had one. And I said, I don't know if we use that or not. But I was thinking you'd get like a thousand. <laughs> no, I mean, that's what I was saying about when we moved here and the REM thing and all that. I thought, I guess, thought everything was gonna be signed to Wonder Brothers and shit. So I didn't know where it was going when we we're flying to England eight times. Let me ask you a question: the White Noise record and Electric Storm was that a huge influence for you at the at the time? Yeah, Black Black Foliage. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Super Furry Animals gave it to us on tour. Okay, so it's a great record. I fucking love it. But I will say that a guy who is experiencing the flush of new success, who decides that an electric storm is the way forward, is a guy who is extremely interesting, who I want to talk to for a very, very long time about intention. What is the story here? Because that's not a way to broaden your appeal. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was funny. <laughs> this is what <laughs> Eric. I mean, we've been playing shows over years. Is this really what you want to do? Yeah. Cool. Because I mean, I mean he, he he understood cut ups and all you know all that stuff. But he's like, he's really yeah. And Eric was in. He was already in. But yeah, you know, he was like okay. He just, <laughs> but bring the album together through these things and you know little what are they called <laughs> animation bits. You know. You know. I said mm -hmm. yeah. He was cool. I mean, he was in. Then, you know. So from what I know about it, you or you and Bill, but I'd love clarification on this, wanted to explore the concept of dreams and the way they emulate life with unexpected deviations like going to work naked. That's kind of all I know about the quote unquote concept. Can you yeah. talk to me if there was an overriding principle to the record? There was it. We just wanted to explore that and the dreams are interesting, you know, so that's the reason. We thought if people send into something. Is it a concept album or is the dreamscape thing, is that like window dressing to make the sound, bring it in a cooler direction? It, I think it ended up being that or something throughout our two years or whatever round experience. Bill, it was kind of sad in the inside. You know, it's like, it's, and that last last song in there is just, that's, that's for me, man. That That's for me. He was having a hard time for time. Take me away from this food chain link. What the you, mean, fuck? you mean with success? He was having a hard time with success? Well, he wanted it to happen quicker or something. And we were all like, whoa. It's not something we discussed. Like, isn't this crazy? I mean, too much, at least. It came up, but it was like, we don't. How do you explain that kind of drive, though? I can't explain yeah. it. I, my drive now at 51 is maniacal. I put up three shows a week, and I don't know, honestly, where it comes from. I really don't. I was not, you know, touched inappropriately by anyone in my family. There's nothing I could point to and say, that's why I do what I do. I see what you mean. Okay. You said you quit your job and did all this. I mean, the really short story is that I'm a filmmaker. I made two features. Then I met my wife. I got a straight job testing for hearing loss and fitting hearing aids. Was very successful at it. All this medical stuff happened. And the artistic thing came back with such a searing intensity that I literally had no control over turning my back on my career. Seems like it. Yeah. That's the story there. That's so cool. I mean, so the hearing aids thing, that's, yeah. so that's how you can really help him. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. That's how I was able to help Bob, for sure. But let's talk about Black Foliage. This is a super interesting record. This is like an eel to me. This record is an eel to me. Cool. Because I've heard it so many times, and I cannot get a grasp on this thing. <laughs> it, it always eludes my grasp, no matter yeah. how 
hard I try to understand it, it wiggles free at every turn. You give it a four. Yeah. It is not a bad thing. I think it's an amazing... Well, dark, dark, kind of overall, kind of dark tinge over it. You know? I think it's very dark. Okay, cool. I did too. I did too. Very dark. And yeah. even when you guys are melodic, it's painted in all kinds of minor key tones. It's a lot of yeah. minor key stuff all over the place. There's only scant spots where it traverses the same type of hopeful early period psychedelia like yeah. dusk but yeah. otherwise it's got its feet planted in altamont psychedelia wow yeah wow yeah got it uh, that, yeah. am i getting it wrong this is how it hits my ear <laughs> that's what i say over time that's the way it was created the things between and all this crazy shit happened to us but we didn't set out to record a dark psychedelic record you know it just these things happen in life you know we were still writing songs here's another thing that i think is just astounding is that there are tracks on here that range from four seconds to over 11 minutes and the content of the four second song and the 11 minute song is similar so how do you even distinguish what a quote-unquote track is anymore is it just an arbitrary assignation that you just toss out every now and then to keep people able to skip through the record the four second track was we were going to have a song on there that we put out later there was supposed to be something there but <laughs> we'll, we'll use it later it's like a blank space almost <laughs> it's, like, it's like hideaways it's a good pop song i mean i think as far as you know things bill brought in New Day, you know. Before we launch into it, talk to me about Robert Schneider's involvement in both records and if his role changed in Black Foliage. We did all the stuff because we bought a reel-to-reel -reel here and we got a sh shop to put it in and stuff. So for a year, we had a place to record whenever, loudly, you know, in a kind of industrial. I bought a organ, like a, a home organ kind of thing you know, and painted it. It looks really cool. Who did that? I remember staying up one night, all night, and nobody else. And anyway, <laughs> they made uh, little speed mini things, you know. These, these. Anyway, but I stayed up all night. I mean, when uh, Eric came the next day, I was like, I got something to play you. And it was uh, grass cannons, you know. Yeah. And he was like, oh, cool. And he had, I played drums, but on it, but I mean, it's there. But, but, you know, he tried to do some stuff. He's so good at, like, he knows how he's going to travel drumming. He knows exactly when to make what I'm doing sound so much better. Same with, uh, you know, he's like, swing. This seems like a really good time to ask this question. So from the Elephant Six enthusiast group, Chris Oliver asked, and I love this question, I'd love to know Will's process when he's putting together all the little sound collages that are all over Olivia and Circulatory System albums. And fuck, so would I. Well, for that... Little by foliage, we had a DAT player, digital audio tape player thing. Let me ask you, are you a fastidious cataloger? So when you have bits, pieces, not anymore. somebody who does this kind of thing, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's good if they have like a really strong anal capacity. And yeah. you don't seem like that kind of a guy in a good way. I'm just not, not necessarily. I did before I got sick, you know. Oh, okay, I, okay. I, watch, uh, I have notebooks printed out really nicely. You know? <laughs> Talk to me about your, because this is amazing work. How did you put it together? What's your process like? Just trial and error, really. How do you know when you'd hit on something that worked? It just, that I I mean, just felt right? Yeah, I just, yeah, I would uh, record shit, put it on cassette, and my uh, girlfriend had speakers, right? And so I would microphone, echo pedal, okay? So I, I'd go, whatever the sound was that I've made, it was like, yeah, or something, but I could go, and let it go, and let that, and it, and the echo would fade out, fade out with it, you know, like, that's the echo I'm doing, you know, that kind of thing. And then uh, record that onto another thing, you know, put that on track two. And when you say I, was Bill ever involved with this? I was doing all this, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did he have zero interest? Let me ask you this pointedly. Did he see this as atmosphere for what really were pop songs from him? No, 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 he, he, he liked the idea. He okay. was always behind me. You make up the concepts as you, you know, in lyrics, and I would give him lyrics and he'd use some of them and change some of the lyrics, you know. Well, like, for instance, uh, let's see, that one is like, you know, underneath the climb, you know, <laughs> and he, he would stretch that out, stretch it out, you know. Same, he went through black foliage. He was like, me, I keep just kept going, like, you know, for whatever this is, you know, just trailing off from something I'd written at my mom's, I mean, it was Christmas, and I wrote all this shit down, you know. And, Brought it and whatever recorded. He was just going, you know, he's just leave it at that, you know. 
Like, it was good at that sort of thing. You know, he had an interest in doing stuff like that, but we were having a hard time. The whole band were getting along directly, and all these changes were praised, you know? We played 200 shows or something that year. It's, these are things I kind of remember, you know? You, were you guys scared? About what? I, I think just the success or just the ramifications of everything. Yeah, yes, actually, because we weren't going to do remix and you know we weren't going to change you see what i mean I said, whatever you said like start to start off with some of these noise of the end. but we're sincere about we, what we wanted and we still thought wow top of most of pop you know, like we could be one of those bands that did great pop songs and had noises and all this shit but you know within a certain thing but it wasn't falling together <laughs> Electra Records was courting us for quite a few times. They flew us out to LA a few times. And we got like eight times. And it, it was like, that right to remix? No, we're not. Because it's like, I mean, you know, well, you know, Jumping Fence is pretty good, but we can add some sheen up. No, you can't touch right, it. Right. That's what we were like. You know, yeah, like a, like, like a horn set. Yeah, sheen. No, you're not adding shit. You're not adding shit, baby. <laughs> you know, no. So that was our the right to remix things. <laughs> so we, yeah, yeah. But do you think that- you guys could have, if you wanted yeah. to, That's, yeah. you guys could have pumped out hits? Yeah, no question. But it's not the milieu you guys wanted to hang in. You guys yeah. were not only comfortable doing it a certain way, but it seems like the reward was you got to do it that way. Yeah. Nice, yeah. Why the fuck, you know, why regret history? It was meant to be this way. Why regret history? It's also oftentimes better to know that I know for sure I could have done this and I chose not to. It's much more interesting, always. It's true. So when you become a major, you get yet another show on Wednesday. Either Discography's The Top Ten, our Buried Treasure show, Rock Cousteau, our Slag Off show, Queasy Listening, or exclusive limited series like The Private Press with Paul Major. And if you've got no financial worries to speak of, keep in mind that some of the higher Patreon tiers allow you to actually advertise on the show, choose the bands we cover, or even some of the guests we get. For the price of a cup of coffee a week, you can ensure my family's fed, build a music library that'll be the envy of your block, and connect to a thriving community of music maniacs all at the same time. Don't risk feeling badly about yourself by not giving. Patreon.com slash Discograffiti. Once again, that's Patreon.com slash Discograffiti. First of all, tell me, is it just that it sounds good? A peculiar noise called Train Director. Immediately, I'm confused, and I just started your record. Kelly's like, you mean conductor? I was like, I think I did. <laughs> she goes, what's the time? I was like, I don't know. Is this, is this your song, basically? Did you bring yeah, it to the song? song? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, my God. If there's one line that sums up this band better than any other line ever, yeah. In the oh. blink of an eye, you get several meanings. What a great line! Thanks, man. <laughs> my, yeah, my mom was like, <laughs> she was like, I mean, she she knows. She asked, when you come back down. <laughs> <laughs> she like, yeah, yeah, you know, Jimmy G, dude, it's no big deal. But immediately, there's a darker hue to this. The fucking storm cloud hanging over this. Yeah. And I could tell immediately because the other one comes out all punchy and fuzzy. And then this one kind of shirks into being. Yeah. Shout to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a Montreal couple of them came by. They were playing the new thing. And I cranked it up. And we were like, what the fuck? I mean, they loved it. I mean, but it was just instrumental. Then we get bits and pieces that you call combinations, but this one is four seconds. This is the one <laughs> I was referring to. Is Hideaway Bill's? Hideaway Bill, yeah. Oh, man, what a song. I mean, that's, yeah. that really is like the, it feels like at least musically, one of his key works, especially yeah. the lyric, that contrasting lyric, again, that we can't work it out kind of a thing. Don't yeah. hide away from all your daydreams or your nightmares. It's just the top roast of the pop roast, classic OTC. Yeah. I was in a band with this guy. I mean, it's beautiful, man. Yeah. yeah. Two more acoustic guitars, two more acoustic guitars, the horns. Okay, what is So Long Seiku Goodbye Rain? That's something. I don't know how to get him and his wife, I think. I mean, no, I think it's from some book he was reading. Like, you know, probably Heinlein. He read a lot. So, like, I love it. Whatever it is, I like better that you don't really. <laughs> it's even yeah, better yeah. that way. Either way, has got to be his best song on the record. Maybe his best song. I mean, yeah, God. Anyway. It's way up there. This album is interesting in that one of its main thrusts 
is not the songwriting. It's about sound design and about how sound aggregation of all kinds of maximalist type sounds can make somebody feel. And there's yeah. songs in that, and it's part of that, it's part of that world, but it's not the main focus, it seems. Yeah, yeah, I've got a lot of secret songs. Yeah. My favorite thing is that phasing, like, it says it's like hollow phasing kind of thing in it. It's anyway, I'm probably. <laughs> We're becoming friends now, so I'm now getting a little more animated. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I can go until the morning. All right. So then you have three songs, a minute, 11, 14 seconds, and four seconds. Mwah! <laughs> <laughs> you like that? Thank you. Yes, thank you. And <laughs> then, okay, so then we're back in with songs. So A Sleepy <laughs> Company. I know that's you, right? That's me. You know. That's you, yeah. Tell me about that one. That is... He wrote, the... he wrote that part. Okay, okay. Yeah, for putting... A bunch of violins on there. I love the the breakdown in the middle of the song. <laughs> That's my favorite part. I Thank really, you, yeah. really love that. It's a real chopping thing. I mean, I did that on a digital, took like mini discs. It seems like you could be able to do it on a computer. Grass Cannons is my favorite song of yours on the record. I love Grass Cannons. What I love about this too is that it's still got pop smarts from the first record. It's still painted darker, but the darkness ultimately doesn't trump the fact that it's really just catchy as hell. Uh, yeah. There's like a twilight energy on it rather than the bright sunniness. Ooh, the, the theremin from Eric. He did that. Ooh, that's stuff. Who's on xylophone? That's a couple of people that they're doing that do 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 stuff at the end. Do, 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 yeah. Like toward the end. That's, that that's, yeah, that's a band that was around at the time that did, had a bunch of Indian instruments or Indian okay. instruments. I mean, I wasn't there. I wasn't there when they did it, but I was like, God, this shit sounds amazing. This has to be one of those songs where you were just so psyched when it came together. You had to. I, been... I, well, I, yeah, I was. Because like I said, I wrote it in one night. I got that organ that I mentioned to me. And everybody left, and I but I stayed up all night, give you high, and, and wrote, you know. So I did the bad drumming, you know, and yeah, yeah. Up and, but he, a great drummer, he can make it. I mean, I was very proud. Yeah, and Eric was oh, it's really cool. You know, it's a masterpiece. It's it's definitely one of the best. The, to me, the album peaks with the one-two punch of Grass Cannons and A New Day, just almost overwhelmingly great. Those two together. Yeah, Bill's the one introduced me to some of these things but uh tony conrad mm-hmm. drink the drone it's also in fire you know she says and then it does it's like a seventh or something long durations you know do it at ludlow apartment in new york 60 whatever just love and crowd getting together for the first time but john kale tony conrad marion zazila and you know what i'm talking about yeah yeah he, he like 65 yeah. angus mcleese they had a fucking loft and they, but they got huge speakers so you could do that. It's fucking loud as fuck. And that really would take you so I mean, that, and then those two doing. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you I think there were some early Spaceman 3 releases that were trying to mine similar territory, like Dream Weapon. Yeah. Dream Weapon, yeah. Yeah, they have like one note things that were like an hour long. I don't know, the rest of the record feels super dark. Even the songs are, are dark. The dream sequences yeah. are very dark as well. I have been floated. I've been floated. That's a Pete song. Oh, really? Song, yeah. Okay. Are the other guys writing more? No, uh, Bill and I always thought it was our thing, but Pete was writing good songs. This is a perfect addition to this record. It just belongs on the record. Paranormal Echoes is you, right? Yes. This is awesome. Uh-huh. This, could, this could be my favorite sort of collage-like track on the record. Also, because it actually turns into a song over a minute in. I like the fact that it actually combines both elements. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. This one is great because it's not one like Grass Cannons, where I think of it first when I think of the record. But every time it hits, it's always satisfying. A Place We Have Been To, another one like that. Yeah. Kind of sounds like a spy theme at the outset. Well, I was thinking, try to reference your own stuff, you know, like Zappa would do or something. The last record that you did. But then I didn't realize we had done it. Because, yeah, you know, Cubes Castle watching my friends. I was like, oh, fuck, yeah. we have to. The has done that. How did you like Black Foliage, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I got to know, side three, were there any band disagreements about side three? Because this is what I would have to deem the difficult side, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> no, except for the, the record company. Did they say something? V2, which is our label in England. Yeah, yeah. We're like, 
we're not quite finished with the album, but uh, you know, we're thinking of taking a few things off. Oh, oh which ones? <laughs> you know, excitedly. <laughs> <laughs> not the bark and below it by chance, right? Not that 14 minute track, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe hide away. Kidding. <laughs> okay, so here's another thing that is just awesome about you guys. Not only do you have an 11 and a half minute sound structure thing, <laughs> but that has a minute and a half coda. Doesn't <laughs> Really? It does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> the bark and below it is 11 and a half minutes, but that's not enough. So Black Foliage Animation 4 is secret. Look, I mean, in all fairness, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I'd rather know your intention rather than my armchair dreamer version of it. But it feels like sequencing, pacing, things like that were not the point. That was not the point. That track or video? You know, no, no, no. In general, okay. the idea of, you know, we've gained momentum here. Let's, you know, the sense of dynamics. I feel I like you were intentionally loosening your belt on either deciding to focus on it at all. Well, kind of explain it again. because, I... You know, in the beginning of American Werewolf in London, where they walk off the moors. Yeah. Okay, so you're walking off the moors, or you're off the path, right? Yeah. Or you're just like deep in the woods. You're deep in the woods. Yeah. That's, that's side three. Yeah, so that's... was that a thing where it was like, I don't care about how someone feels about pacing, sequencing. This is for the patient listener, so I don't give a fuck about whether right. or not someone... That's exactly that. Was it? Uh, yeah, I don't, yeah. We, uh, okay. Yeah. We knew it was going to be dense and everything, but to me, it's, it's silly, but side three is the troop out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In a stupid stoner way, you know. Not, no, not at all. I mean, Listen, I am not denigrating this. I'm a gumma, you know, anyway. <laughs> right. So this is like just a dense jungle through which one must navigate to reach side four. And it's intentionally set there. And that's incredible to me. I mean, in no way is that a negative. I'm just curious if that was your intention approaching it. Because uh -huh. then, you you know, you approach side four, California demise is what you get to. There's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow of pop smarts and a beautiful touch where you left a skip in the mastering, right? That's uh, accidental, yeah, we were sequencing it. it. We did that and we were like, fuck, love it, you know? Yeah, Bill and I, it was only Bill and I there. We looked at each other smiles, yes, that's fucking cool. Look, 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 cause he, he's like, <laughs> we look kind of smile, like, yeah, let's leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> can send it back. And I think it's fucked up, you know? <laughs> but, we were like, that's pretty cool. Though. It's either that or the final Hilltop Procession momentum gaining. Side yeah. four is not side three in terms of being difficult. It's more of a combination of one and three. That song is the closer, man. Wow. Do you think that what he's saying? I think it's great. But I also think there's some stuff on this side that feels to me like there's a depression. Looking yeah. for quiet seeds, mystery, and another set of bees in the museum. Yep. Are to me s sad songs written by somebody who's unhappy. Yeah, I was having some yeah thoughts. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's all the words of me, in my brain. Is it? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, you know, all these things were crazy. You know, the, what I was saying earlier, like we have pop stuff, and, you know, but can we make it do this and still? keep our concepts and you know, artwork and stuff that we have always agreed on and believed in since we've been kids, you know, toppermost and stuff. But when it's all happened at once, you can't really process that shit. <laughs> and you're you know? being honest about it. You're being honest about it because if this is a replication in any way of your thought process at this time, it's an overload. Yeah, it's true though. I mean, like mystery, it has a, it's good in the end. I'm not talking about it being bad or good. It's just okay. I can tell it's sad. Yeah, but it's like yeah, cover me, you know, smother me. I think we can, you know. It's like, but then hey, but then the chorus, hey, you know, that's yeah, the, yeah. So yeah. there's dichotomy because I am both those things, you know. But yeah, yeah. It's like wow, but you are, yeah, you're right. It's true. It's Look, true. I know, I know you're projecting. I'm going to say it's two stars or whatever, whatever stupid thing. But I promise, uh, it's a high rating. It's four and two thirds stars that I gave it. I don't have the, a similar kind of connection with this one that I do with Dusk, but rating wise, it's in the same exact ballpark. It's just a dense thicket. And sometimes when I enter that world, it can be scary, the kinds of emotions it can produce. So I don't go there with the same kind of frequency. That's all. Yeah. Good call. That same kind of frequency. 
Nice. But it's a great album. I mean, okay. you guys I'm made good. two masterpieces in a row. That's not bad. Not many bands can say Actually, that. That's a double sound. I mean, I was do that, but but I mean that it doesn't even matter though, because people put out double albums, but people don't know. I'm sorry, doing CD, you wouldn't have really known as much. Most importantly, though, you built two separate and distinct sound worlds that yeah. exist oh. in perpetuity yeah. for people to enter into and really get lost in. It's like yeah. you open up the door and close it, and the door disappears behind you. Yeah, That's... and once you get that razor blade from here. <laughs> 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 so so maybe you can shed light on this but after black foliage came out there were tensions that grew between you and bill right yeah you wanted to take a break from music right yeah and were you at that point suffering from early symptoms of ms between you and i yeah and it, it, impossible to connect with he grew a beard like civil war beard and I just, you couldn't communicate he grew he grew a beard like that yeah, I mean, it just it just looks so different. Was it really just that he had a beard? Yeah, it was strange. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's hard to reach somebody like that, you know? They're kind of looking through you. Kind of, you know, kind of feel. All of this hectic shit was happening around us, and all this shit's really confusing. And he would kind of look through me, you know, it was just, it couldn't be reached. And, but then would get very, you know, he was going to take care of it, but he wasn't taking, you know. Take care of what exactly? His own personal stuff? The tour diaries and dates, getting ready and stuff. Were you guys handling the business affairs too? Yeah. Oh, that's too and, bad. But then when somebody's like, no, I'm going to take care of it, you know, the loan. And it's like that kind of deal. But there was not a question about it. You see what I mean? But well, I'm just uh, hands off. Suffice it to say, just as a general thing, were you growing apart as friends because success was difficult to process? That's it. Exactly. Was that painful to watch that happen? Or were you just too confused by everything that was going on to even notice? All of this shit happened at once. And, you know, suddenly, yeah, after 2001 or whenever Will Westbrook died, I'd never had a, a good friend. I hadn't known Will that well. But in the last year before he died, we become great. Then suddenly he was fucking gone, man. You know, it, was, it blew my fucking mind. I never had that, but it destroyed me with sadness, the whole thing. I don't want to cloud your, you know, you like these records and I don't want to ruin it for you, you know? There's nothing you would say that would ruin it. For me, this show is just about confronting mm -hmm. life truths using music as a mask. Nice. That's all it is. In any case, you and your best friend had a falling out. I don't know if it was a full falling out. Were you guys not talking to each other? Well, we did later, you know. Of course. <laughs> you guys broke up in 2000. It was during that period, you know, beard and just um, communicate. And I got cool with it now, but I just didn't know how to talk to anybody. You know, it just shut down. So I just didn't answer. I didn't answer the phone at all. What a dick. I mean, he's just, well, what is it? let's work this out. No, you know, no. But you had your I, own I, fears. I I've learned how to communicate now. Well, you were communicating through your music. A lot of your fears at the time were coming through loud and clear. And yeah. so maybe you weren't being able to say it to a brother in pain in the same room, but you were talking through your music. You're right. Yeah. This has been beyond fun. This has been really awesome. Uh, thank you. I can tell the, you're a fan or whatever. You... Yeah, but we would also have a fucking blast if we were hanging out too. Yeah, but it was a... It helps when I can tell that you love music and all the things that you say, it's clear. So thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. No problem. Thanks for making it. See, baby, Sleep baby. tight, man. I really, really appreciate the time. I had a great time. I don't know how to turn this off. Well, let's just keep it going then. We'll just keep it going forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. That about does it. Stay tuned because next week brings part three of the Will Hart series in which we do a head first deep dive into the circulatory system. A heartfelt discography thanks goes out to my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, Will Hart, Kelly Hart, Rudy Fishman, the Elephant Six Multisphere, my incredibly loyal fans, and especially the entire Patreon community, the Soldiers of Sound. I love every last one of you, and this show would not exist without you, my friends. Speaking of friends, it's high time for some new ones. They're in our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. That's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show, but there's a hell of a lot more. You get recaps of the day in music history, the ability to pitch questions to guests, polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and band decisions, and access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for a collaborator. 
So make sure you don't miss out. You can find the link to the Discography Soldiers of Sound Facebook page right there in the show notes. And if you don't mess with the Zuck, no sweat. Just email me at info at discography.com and I'll keep you in the loop. So now that it's done and you want more, another way to dive even deeper into the Gen X flag wavers of 1990s indie alternative gold is to leap headfirst into the David Paho series, including the man himself rating Slint's discography. That's episodes 94 to 101. No Ages Randy Randall rating the Jesus Lizard. That's 70 and 71. My interview with No Ages Randy Randall. That's episode 88. The Bob Nastanovich rates Pavement series from 49 to 58. Nirvana episode 30. The replacements with Bob Mayer 28 and 29. And number 18, The Pixies. And of course, you won't want to miss our Mark Robinson series, which so far encompasses episodes 128 and 130, plus future episodes 135 and 136. Join us during the upcoming week for Discography's week-long My 52nd Birthday Party with Will Cullen Hart Deep Dive. This Sunday, February 4th, which is also my 52nd birthday, please hang out and join the festivities with a special Will Hart birthday party episode. And then on Monday instead of Sunday this week, you can expect another deliriously sociopathic entry of Rudy Fishman's Discography Soldiers of Sound podcast. Lastly, on Wednesday, Lieutenants and Up will be treated to the director's cut of next week's show. And of course, be sure to mark your calendars, because next Friday, February 9th, we're coming at you with part three of our seven-hour Will Hart interview, this time detailing the incredible discography of Will's solo band, The Circulatory System. Trust me, you're not going to want to miss it. And so, from now till then... Don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies. It's this guy graffiti.